Um, We're going to start with Martin, who I have introduced several times. I think I introduced you. Was there a Dal Nagan introduction? I think I remember. Yeah, that's right. I, so it's always my pleasure to uh, introduce Martin, um, which I will now do so his student doesn't have to. Um, <laughs> is that EFPL? That's just gorgeous. That is, uh, that is yeah, that's the learning center, I think, you felt. Yeah. That's that, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I don't think I've ever visited. I'm sure I should. I didn't realize it was, it was that gorgeous. And um, is it fair to say that I think the Swiss have a great uh, heritage in programming language design and in architecture and in design generally? So um, we have to guess what Martin's font is. I actually don't know. It's probably Helvetica, isn't it? It might be Calibri. It's not Helvetica. It's, I don't think it's, Helvetica. it's not Helvetica. I don't think it's Helvetica. Yeah. Yeah, if I had my Swiss watch on, I would have been here on time. But it's certainly a very modern, very clean uh, font. And um, that built, you know, and, and then if you think about, of course, a famous Swiss programming language, Pascal, uh, designed by Niklas Wiert, um, which, you know, people have said it's designed like a Swiss watch. Every little bit fits inside every other little bit, which fits inside every other little bit, because your program should be a syntactic and a semantic tree uh, defined recursively, and that's really what Pascal is, and that's this whole idea of clean lines, simple definitions, uh, modernism, uh, which you can see in that building and which the kind of complexity you often face if you allow aliases and if you allow mutable state into your programming language. Oh, cool, I can keep ranting so Martin can switch off his phone, uh, and then you won't realize I've gone. Um, that idea of modernism, that idea of clean lines, of clean definitions. And the thing about that building is it looks simple, but that building couldn't have been designed or made to stand up 20 or 30 years ago because the subtle shapes and the subtle curves you can see in that building can only be done and verified using uh, CAD techniques, using computers and using computer systems that look simple, but it's really, really complicated if you want to make something that looks simple. And um, I'm always happy to push that when I'm talking to Martin. I do think he is definitely the most talented compiler writer of our generation. Um, I've known him for... I don't remember seeing you in South Australia, That's where you'd moved yeah, in order to yeah. enjoy the w yeah. warm weather. That slightly less. And uh, yeah, feelings, your, your fate yeah. did not leave you in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm delighted to introduce Martin, who's talking about what I really think is one of the, the really clever, or the yeah, clever ideas that have emerged in the last few years in this area, capture tracking. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, this was a great extemporary thing about this building you knew nothing about, but <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> but I, 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 can, uh, I can stay on, yeah, I mean, it's all, all correct. Uh, so, so the building was actually designed by a pair of Japanese architects who got the Pritzker Prize later on. Um, and if you see, look at it from the, from, from the air, it looks like a Swiss cheese. There are lots of holes in it. Uh, it look, looks like a Swiss cheese that you put on the, on the heating so that it gets slightly wobbly. Uh, so <laughs> and and the, 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 the secret behind that is not just computer design, but absolutely tons of uh, concrete. So uh, <laughs> I remember we, we did a little extension where we needed 15 uh, square meters of concrete that high, and I, we couldn't get them for a whole week because that building was constructed, and essentially all the concrete in the canton was, was earmarked towards that building because that's essentially a meter, meter thick. So Swiss architects were actually very... Um, critical about that at first because it's not at all resource conscious. So, it is, so the CO2 footprint of this thing was, was gigantic. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, let's, let's not talk about the building. Let's talk about this thing here at the bottom, uh, Scala, and how we do uh, capture tracking in Scala. And I should also say that uh, this is joint work with uh, some people in this room, Alex, uh, Ed, uh, some people not, not here, Jonathan, uh, uh, Andre Lotak, uh, Yichen should be here. Uh, 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 no, he'll, he'll, other people will show up, I guess. Okay, ah, Jonathan is here. Yeah, when, to speak of the devil. Yeah, <laughs> just just talked about uh, you in the uh, collaborators. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to do this from the back forward. So I'm going to talk about Scala a little bit and why I believe that capture tracking or generally aliasing ownership is an important thing for uh, Scala to acquire. We could say, well, Scala is already a fairly rich language, so why, so why would, would we want to add this? Uh, so 
I think one of the reasons is that uh, Scala, with, a, with some other languages, which we also know and like well, was quite unique uh, 12 years ago. Uh, it was unique in the space to have uh, to be fairly strong on functional programming and at the same time have fairly good, strong static type systems. And of course, you can go further. So then there's, there's always Haskell if you want uh, both functional programming and excessive types. Uh, but these languages sort of struck a nice balance. And uh, uh, whereas the industry was essentially here at the at the bottom and at the left, so they had nothing of functional programming and. A lot of them had, uh, were dynamically typed. That was, in 2010, still a big thing uh, where people were arguing that dynamic is better than static. So if we look at what happened since then, then we see that all these other languages made a trajectory into, into the sweet spot here. So Java got uh, lambdas, and now it even got uh, records and pattern matching. Uh, Python got uh, PyPy, uh, uh, optional types. All these languages got... Uh, JavaScript got TypeScript, Ruby got Sorbet, uh, Lisp uh, moved, uh, got, got uh, uh, contracts and uh, typed racket and all these things. Essentially, they all got type systems and the more imperative languages uh, uh, um, acquired functional features at a furious pace, you could say. So that right now, what, where we are is essentially here, they all moved very close to essentially where Scala, OCaml, F-sharp were. And uh, there's also a, a lot of newcomers, uh, Kotlin, Swift, Rust, that also are somewhere in this space. Some of them are more functional, some of, some of them are less, but all of them are pretty okay on, this, on that side, and all of them have fairly expressive type systems. So Scala has lost its uh, role of uniqueness. I mean, you could say, well, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And indeed, you f indeed, you find many, many features that were pioneered in Scala. I'm not saying invented in Scala, but essentially first pioneered in a, for a mass audience that other languages picked up. So Scala is no longer along in its space, and I, I believe it is by now a lot cleaner, smaller. In fact, if you look at the grammars, all these languages are much, much bigger than what, what Scala is, and more expressive than most of the other languages. But to what degree does that matter? So that's one thing. The other thing is a cultural thing, and that was uh, actually previewed even in 2009. So the, the <laughs> 2000, the, this uh, James Irie, who was uh, he wrote this, uh, this blog post, A Brief, Incomplete, and Mostly Wrong History of Programming Languages. Uh, it's hilarious. If you don't know it, you should definitely read it. Uh, it's about, essentially, he has something to say about uh, most, most programming languages out there, usually quite mean. Um, and uh, it, it ends with this one here. Uh, yeah, a drunken Martin Odersky sees a Reese Pretty Peanut Buttercup ad featuring somebody's peanut butter getting on somebody else's chocolate and has an idea. He creates Scala, a language that unifies constructs from both object oriented and functional languages. This pisses off both groups and each promptly declares jihad. And that was actually very prescient. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, in 2009, I laughed about it and said, well, good joke. But what actually happened since then in the Scala community is a lot of fighting between pure functional people and essentially people who like their effects and their objects and things like that. So the question then is, uh, where Scala is, what should it become? Where, where do we want to uh, evolve it to? So some people think that Scala should essentially cede its current space, where OCaml, F-sharp are, and put more emphasis on pure functional programming. Scala has higher kind of types, and uh, it has four expressions, so it has some of the ingredients for that. So, and the, that goes under functional Scala, which is actually a misnomer, I think. Uh, uh, monadic Scala, or uh, some people jokingly use the name Haskellator as the stairs leading to Haskell. But uh, I, I really think what this is, is it's really staged imperative programming through effect systems. So essentially you, you use a function programming to construct an effectful program, and that effectful program you, 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 you know nothing about. It's defined in some library, uh, according to the laws of some library. So it's really not a big mystery, and uh, when, you know, no, no, not a big deal. And when people say, this is functional Scala, then I think it's a gross misnomer. It's staged imperative programming. So they think we should move to the right, towards Haskell. On the other hand, what I believe is that uh, the benefits of functional programming are, uh, it's, it's 
there's a law of diminishing returns for them like for almost everybody else. So some promoters claim that the purer you are, the more, ut the more utility you will get. I think it levels off somewhere, and depending on where you are, you might, it might even drop off if you push it too far. <coughs> so uh, I, can, uh, I have a, given another talk at the Scala Symposium where I backed that up with code examples. Uh, we don't have time for that, so you just have to take me at my word here to, to say, well, that's, that's where I believe uh, we have essentially the local optimum, and that's also where Scala more or less is. Uh, it was designed that way. Uh, you could say, well, okay, for an ideal programmer audience, that might be the case. There are diminishing returns. We want to find the local optimum. Here we are, a case closed. Uh, the problem is that uh, we don't usually have ideal programmers. In fact, if you look at industry, then most people say, well, working in a team is terrible. Well, the people who wrote my code before that I now have to maintain were idiots. Uh, and all I need is essentially to, ways to constrain other people, that they don't do terribly stupid things, I industry things like that. So essentially, expressiveness, power, counts for nothing, constraints, rigidity is, is more important. Cookie cutter recipes is, is the things that people want. So here the problem is that if you use VARs and other effects responsibly, we can make the code cleaner and more performant at some point. But how do we ensure they are used responsibly? How do we, don't we open the, 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 the gates to the floodgates that essentially people will do whatever and that our code will become very hard to maintain? We could th think of code reviews, definitely, but sometimes do things, uh, things do uh, slip through. We could think of tests, but uh, some of the problems that arise are essentially data races or uh, leaking uh, references or things like that. And these are very, very hard to, to, to find uh, with tests. So typically, Scala programmers, they like the, the guardrails. Uh, and uh, that means we are faced with an uneasy choice. We can say, well, we want to be simple in the language, no fancy effect systems, uh, uh, and also performant, uh, but unsafe. Or we want to be safe, uh, but complex and slow. And uh, that brings me to another thing that um, the languages are a sort of like tutors or gentle guidance for programmers. Uh, so I, 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 since when I started Scala, I thought I give full uh, responsibility to programmers. They know what they do, uh, maximum power. Uh, that was my biggest shift the last 20 years to say, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> programmers will abuse absolutely everything you give them. Uh, so uh, we need to, uh, and we can't prevent them, but we, we need to find languages that give them good guidance. And here for... Um, in fact, uh, there's also a problem in that a program that, um, ideally, a program that looks simple on the surface should also be safe and predictable. So that means my guidance is essentially shortness and clarity of code, and that means if I do that, then my program will become better. So that's essentially what, what we would like. But with effects, that, that's not always the case, because using effects can make programs shorter. Ah, let me just put in this var in, in here and not essentially thread through this value through a mountains of uh, options and other monadic constructs. Uh, but then it would also make it harder to reason about. So essentially, you have the, the easy, easy thing, which in the end is actually not so good. And that means, means that a lot of uh, Scala programmers actually shun effects whatsoever. They, they, they say, no, you, you shouldn't use a var ever because you can misuse it that way. And uh, that means that uh, some vars are inherently evil, what, what those people say. And, and you, should, you should do pure function programming. And so the answer here would be a staged architecture for effects where you say, in the first stage, we have a pure function program that describes a usually monadic computation. And in the second stage, we execute the effects in the chosen monads. So there are quite a few very uh, uh, popular systems in Scala. So one is Cat's effect, the other is Zio. Uh, and they all work essentially like this. You have this, essentially this pure function program uh, that constructs a program that essentially then has access to all the capabilities of a computer. Uh, error handling, file system network, and whatever. But it means that essentially at that stage it's free for all. So there's, there are no more 
essentially the, the constraints you get, the, the assurances you get are the assurances of the library, which library authors like. They can design what they want, but maybe users in the language uh, are uh, disadvantaged because I think as a language designer and compiler writer, you can do more than as a library writer. So the, the white thing is what programs can do, and then the uh, blue thing is what computers can do, and they do it in, essentially indirectly by constructing a program. So the problems with the, uh, this monadic approach to effect system, in my opinion, is first, it's quite a big notational overhead. You have to do these four expressions or do, do, do things in Haskell everywhere. And the other thing is, uh, and I think that's a deeper one, that uh, monads don't compose. Uh, so monads themselves don't compose, so we have invented a lot of other techniques that work better, monad transformers, uh, finally tagless, MPL, freer monads, and so on and so on. So every, I have the impression every year or two there's another new kid on the block which say, well, we finally solved this problem, but it gets never solved. The problem gets just pushed around, and this is essentially, it's always a, a, a problem to deal with these things. Um, the other approach, which actually in industry seems to be more successful, is the guard monad approach. So we put everything in a single monad uh, that uh, essentially handles everything that you should ever need. So Zio is a popular library that, that uses that, that approach. Uh, uh, and the problem with that is Zio has three type parameters for everything. So every program you start with has three type parameters for what is it, environment, error, and result. And uh, that can lead to over-provisioning. Sometimes I don't need an uh, environment, sometimes I want to do my own error handling and things like that. So it forces you into a framework that if applications uh, fit that framework, it works well, and typically industrial programmers like guidance, they like essentially a fixed way to do things, but many, pro many uh, uh, programs don't fit into that framework. So the industry experience with this so far, I think, has been mixed. So what's the alternative? So one alternative would be to say, uh, well, uh, we want to, um, instead of, uh, but what we see so far is we have essentially languages that are, some of them are more functional, more lambda-like, and others are essentially more effectful, like C, C++. So those are languages that where everything that you do, every statement has a side effect, and uh, nothing can return ever. So the other dimension here, which is interesting, is to say, well, can we do compile time tracking of these effects? Well, here we have languages with a lot of low-level effects up there, functional languages with few. And uh, the tracking thing has gained, track, uh, has, has gained, gained uh, popularity recently, uh, in particular with Rust. So Rust is a fairly low-level language in the fact that it has lots and lots of effects that it exposes them. Uh, but they are finely tracked. So the question, of course, is to say, well, can we do something like this up here? What would be different up here? Well, there would be fewer effects. Our programs would be more predominantly functional. We would minimize effects uh, to, to the absolutely necessary. And hopefully, we would essentially be, be more abstract. In particular, what we want to do is we really want to get away from this idea in Rust that we have to control the lifetime of every piece of memory we look at. So we want, we want to say, well, no garbage collectors, they're actually good garbage collectors, help us write concise codes. And in many, in many situations, we don't need, uh, we, we don't care about the performance overhead, which often is, uh, doesn't exist anyway. Uh, but of course, we want to be able to escape when uh, a garbage collector turns out to be a problem, then locally we want to maybe use a different allocation. And over the last uh, 20 years, there has been lots and lots of research on this thing. So I just give some uh, research areas, research projects, Singularity, Mezzo, uh, where research projects, alias types, algebraic effects, uh, linear Haskell. A lot of stuff has been happening there. Uh, but it's probably fair to say that none of that is sort of in widespread adoption yet. Uh, so here we have our own uh, uh, entry in the field, where, which is called CAPRESE. And CAPRESE is a um, abbreviation, uh, acronym for Capabilities for Resources and Effects. So that's a large um, Swiss National Fund project that just started this year in May and will go for the next five years. And uh, I'm essentially 
uh, giving this talk uh, to essentially tell you what it, what, is, what it is about and where we are with it. So cap caprese means capabilities for resources and effects, and it turns out that capabilities provide safe typing for both resources and effects. Uh, capabilities in that thing, they're simply values uh, in the object capability sense, so I pass a value to it, uh, an unforgeable value, uh, then you have the capability. Uh, for ergonomics in Scala, they are passed as implicitly passed values. We have this nice implicit mechanism that uh, avoids all the craft of essentially passing these things explicitly, and that makes them actually workable and quite nice to use. Uh, there's still um, a, a, a big question. Uh, to say, well, capabilities are things that I give you, but you might hang on to them. I might say, okay, now I have the capability, now let me keep that uh, for the next stage, uh, and that uh, we have to track in a type system, as it turns out. That's a, actually an important uh, difference, whether I um, take a capability to do an effect now, or whether I store the capability to have an effect in the future, and the type system needs to do that. So with capabilities, uh, we can get to a different architecture where now, essentially, we, we are not, no longer a stage program. We are, we are, we are a single-stage program. We can access the whole computer in by our program, uh, but each of these things is guarded by a capability, which is the key. Uh, so that's essentially the, the diff there's essentially a difference in outlook for uh, the previous system. Uh, da -da. Can we, uh, yeah, this one here. The previous system says, well, uh, my philosophy is computers are defined by the lambda calculus. That's what my program can do. And all this thing is magic. We construct a program that then is done by a library that does certain things simply. Whereas here, the, the new uh, way uh, philosophy is to say, no, 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 uh, programs can do everything that computers can do. So all these effectful things a program can do, but we need essentially protection. We need, uh, we need to essentially moderate these things with capabilities. You can do it only if you have the capability. Okay, so um, what kind of effects are worth with typing here? So uh, important things, I believe, are data races, use after free or close, uh, unhandled exceptions, and the several more. But I think there's another question. Uh, it's a more philosophical question. We, we want types to reflect and constrain the possible behaviors of our program. So we do not want large classes of poly problematic behaviors to fly under the radar. Even if you say, well, you can debate the question of uh, checked versus unchecked exceptions. There are good arguments on both sides. In the end, you want to have a mechanism where you can do it when you care about it. Uh, uh, a lot of people care about that anyway. So to encourage good code, ideally, we would have uh, encapsulated effects that are easy to declare whereas global effects should be hard. So to, to, to have a, essentially a type system that gives us the good guidance for programs, we want to say, well, if you just put a local variable because of two local variables because they're clearer than a fold or something like that, that shouldn't be a problem. The function is still essentially a pure function on the outside. Whereas if I have a global variable or a field and some globally accessible object that somehow does magic uh, in my program, that should cost quite a lot. And capabilities can enforce that because locally used capabilities are free, and there's nothing to pass, whereas a global resource has to be threaded through everywhere in the types. So they have this promise to say, well, essentially my types reflect sort of the, the difficulty of my, of my program. Uh, the, if my program is hard to reason about, my types should reflect that in also being somewhat nasty. And if my types should be very simple, then the, there should be a high correlation with programs that are simple to reason about. So hopefully we can get soon to a state where shorter and clearer programs also tend to be safe, and we trust the type checker to guide us to produce good code. That's essentially the reason, the, uh, the motivation why we are interested in, in doing this, in adding effects. Okay, so what makes capabilities different from previous work? I mean, there's a bunch of works. Why don't we just pick something off the shelf? Well, the answer is, well, what should we pick? Uh, uh, none, none of that looks that, uh, that uh, 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 appealing to it. Uh, the difference with capabilities mostly is that they are at first just a mechanism, not a policy. So a capability is just a way to, you can express certain things and that way works really well with functional programming. So there's nothing that detracts, it's completely compatible with functional programming. 
uh, whereas uh, otherwise we would, would have to start using uh, policy. For instance, ownership type system, we would have to say, well, there's an ownership role which Lambda Calculus knows nothing about. It's completely foreign to that. Or we would have to talk about move semantics. Again, Lambda Calculus doesn't, doesn't care about move semantics. So we would have to essentially lead with imperative things from the start. In the end, we'll have to get there. If you want to express effects, we'll have to eventually get to, to these things, ownership and move semantics. But the nice thing about capabilities is that at the start, I leave that completely open. It's just a mechanism to describe what is there. So once we can track capabilities, we can add various policies to enforce life, lifetimes, prevent data races, and so on. That's the approach. Also, I'm, I'm going to show you, it turns out that in the end, these capabilities are super lightweight to define and uh, have very, very low notational overhead compared to some of the other approaches that we see. Okay, so um, there, there's one other aspect to it which is very interesting right now, and that's about control effects. So it's not only about uh, capabilities and effects are not only about preventing bad code, but also about enabling new control patterns. So uh, the patterns that um, we are looking at is uh, result with question mark for errors, generators for iterations, futures uh, with a weight for async. And all these things are direct styles, so no, no monadic composition, but the effects are done directly. So that gives us an intriguing new take on reactive uh, systems, and that's made possible by essentially the recent development in coroutines and continuations that are becoming now much more widespread. So on the, on the JVM, we now have Project Loom, which is essentially uh, virtual, virtual threads uh, coroutines. Uh, uh, we, uh, on Scala Native, we have full-blown full delimited continuations. And uh, with these things, we can do really interesting things. So what I believe in the end, what Scala uh, should become over the next years is Essentially, it should stay in this predominantly but not 100% functional segment of languages, but it should expand the footprint of what can be typed well to resources and effects. Good. So that was my uh, overview talk. Uh, I'm, I have another talk, which for technical reason is um, in, in LaTeX, not in PowerPoint. So let me switch to that. Uh, I was not, not at the beginning, yep. Okay. Okay. No, nope, didn't show. Why does it not show? Let me see. Uh, <laughs> uh. Okay, that's better. Okay. Let me just... Um, let me just run this once more through the thing, because I noted that I might have not have done the line latest. Okay. Okay, now we fix the typo. Okay, so um, as I said, the project is about capabilities for resources and effects, and of course there has been lots and lots of work on work on both resources and effects, and some adoption is now also starting, in particular the development around Rust is very, very encouraging, but I think it's fair to say that the mainstream is not yet, uh, not yet touched very much. Uh, so the challenge with all that, and I think that's a challenge that Rust is already facing, is that the notation really needs to be simple and intuitive. And I think Rust is already pushing against its complexity budget there uh, at some point. And for instance, if you look at essentially Rust futures and async, then a lot of people are unhappy with that because they think that that exceeded the complexity budget that, that people are willing to pay. So the, the, we mostly have under, overspent our typing budgets already, and that, that's not just Rust, that's basically all typing languages, type, type languages that essentially already have type systems that are fair, fairly complex, and uh, the, the uh, challenge is not to make that even more complicated by talking about resources and effects. 
So our approach is, as I said, that they can be expressed as capabilities and capabilities can be tracked ergonomically in types. So what, when I talk about resources and effects, what do I mean? Well, resources are values that are available only with certain restrictions. So you can't use the value as you want whenever you want. Uh, examples uh, of restrictions are lifetime, sharing, you can only use this, uh, only one thread can use it at a time. Quantity, that would be a linear type system where you can only have a single value, things like that. So examples are regions of memory, file handles, channels, database or network connections, and many others more. What, what's an effect? Well, an effect is an aspect of the computation beyond the shape of simple input and output of a function that we also want to track in types. So an effect is something that essentially uh, an aspect, it's a thing tracked in a type that goes beyond uh, uh, simple parameters and, 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 and results of functions. So examples are accessing mutable state, throwing exceptions, I.O., suspending a computation, using a continuation for control operations, and so on. And the problem with effects is uh, the, that they are transitive, which leads to the effect polymorphism problem. So unlike other types, for effects, uh, you have this transitivity uh, uh, property, which says that if you have a calling chain from F1 to Fn, and Fn does an effect, then that's indirectly also an effect of F1. Normally types are local, so if, if I return an option, then somebody else takes it apart and, and nobody needs to know about it anymore. But typically with effects, we're transitive. They go up, uh, up all, the t all the way to the call chain. And the problem is that if this call graph is dynamic, which is the usual thing with using high order functions or virtual dispatch, then uh, we have this effect polymorphism problem because we can't really, it's, it becomes very difficult to def describe the effect of the first function, F1, uh, depending on essentially what other functions it's, it, it calls. Okay, so capabilities are a way to uh, encode effects. Uh, and uh, if you don't know that already, here's, here's a simple analogy. So if I have a function F, uh, I can declare that the function returns a type T and it also throws an exception E, and that's clearly an effect declaration. It says the function has an effect. It throws a, a, that exception. Or I can write the function like this. I say the function takes the parameter of type can throw E, that's a capability, and it returns simply a T. And in a way, these things say exactly the same thing. In one way, you say, well, you need the capability, but you return just a T, and here, in the other way, I say it returns a T and it might also throw an exception. This using thing is kind of three syntax for implicit parameters. So we don't need to name them. Uh, we, we can just pass them like that. Okay. Uh, we can also do this. Uh, the analogy even holds in a more fine-grained way. Uh, we can expand it to four steps. Uh, so uh, the first thing is T throws E. That's actually in Scala uh, uh, simply an infix type. So that's that's a syntax for throws T. That's a, a type with two parameters, uh, a type, a uh, result type, and an exception. So it's a, and if you look up what throws is, it's, it's a type alias for a context function type. The context function means that it's a function from can throw E to T, but that function takes its arguments again implicitly. That means the compiler will synthesize the arguments. So it's a context function type. So if you expand that, it becomes that. And that uh, function type is essentially by just essentially shifting things where the dot is from function to method. It's the same thing here. It's just the using thing. So you see there's actually an almost mechanical translation from one to the other things. And uh, that the, the, the mechanics, the foundations of the mechanics were described in uh, the Simplicity paper, Popper 2018. Okay, so, yeah, good. So I can express effects as capabilities, but why should I do that? What's, what's the benefit? What, what do I gain with that? Well, uh, the benefit is that capabilities support effect polymorphism. To see why, look at essentially our paradigmatic function for everything. It's sort of e like E. coli in biology, the map function, the map function on, on lists in this case. So here's map in Scala. We take a function from A to B, the list is of uh, elements A, and it returns a list of B. If we wanted to add 
traditional effects to the function, we, we'd end up with something like that, uh, more or less. So we need an additional parameter E for the effect. Then we say, well, it returns a B and it has this effect E, whatever the, the F thing is. And then the map function would return a list of B and it would have the same effect E. Okay, so, and the problem with that, it, this might look okay, but it really isn't. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that we have doubled the number of uh, type parameters here. And uh, the other problem with that is that this is really, really widespread. So map, you could say, well, if it was just for map and some other higher functions, I could maybe, maybe uh, 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 work around it. But uh, consider in an object-oriented language, every call is essentially a virtual, me virtual method call. So no call that I do, uh, well, most calls that I do, I don't know what the target is. So for most calls that I do, I have to do a, a construct like that. So that would mean I really get a, a huge number of essentially all these effect parameters of all the things that I call that I have uh, then to assemble back. Another proof point why this is really unworkable is this is actually what Java allows you if you write uh, here the in, in, instead of f you write uh, what, what is it pros I think uh, so checked exceptions actually can be polymorphic that way only nobody ever uses it uh, because <coughs> nobody even knows about it because it's just too cumbersome to do people use monomorphic exceptions in, in, in Java they never abstract with a type parameter over it. Okay, so how do capabilities help? Well, if you write the thing in capabilities, then actually nothing changes. Map is exactly the same as it was before. It's just the function from A to B in this You can say, no, no, that, that can't work. I mean, how, how, how can you do something that new that uh, essentially the, uh, that, that, that you haven't covered before? Well, the secret is that this double arrow type is now the type of impure functions that can capture any capability as a free variable. So that's how you do it. Uh, and uh, we, well, since we now all function arrows are impure, uh, it makes sense to also introduce a function arrow for pure functions that can't capture any capabilities. So that uh, would be the single arrow for pure functions in, in future Scala, in the Scala that, that, that implements that thing. So you could say, well, Scala was, we, we were in, incredibly uh, far-sighted with the Scala tw 20 years ago when we introduced it, we used the double arrow because we knew our functions would eventually end up being impure and we wanted to reserve the single arrow for the nice <coughs> functions that you know from Haskell. Well, uh, that's just serendipity, I guess. Okay, so let's see how that would work then actually in, in, in a uh, context where we use a map. So. Uh, I just say my, my effect domains is exceptions because everybody knows about exceptions. So this is, exceptions are not necessarily an ideal effect domain, uh, but everybody knows about them, so let's use them. So uh, what we have is uh, an exception too large and we have a function uh, that does some computation and if uh, the input is less than a limit, uh, it is greater or equal to a limit, we throw the exception too large. And what we then want to do is we want to map that function over a list of ints and sum it uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, we want to catch the too large case and just return minus one. So um, what, the, what, what the system would do with it is this. So it would say, okay, every throws becomes a using can throw. So we have this using can throw here and it just returns an int. So it can throw the too, too large because it, 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 it has the capability to do so, so that's fine. So we have to generate that capability at some point. That's what the compiler will do here. It passes the can throw to the function f. And why can the compiler generate the capability? Well, because the exception is cocked. So that's essentially one part where we essentially do uh, enrich the meaning of the try to say, if you catch an exception in that try, then we can generate the capability to throw that exception. Okay, and the trick with the map now is, so this can throw here, this capability, where does it end up? It ends up in the closure of f. So f is, 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 is a function value, uh, and it, ends up, it, it takes a parameter x, but that thing will end up in its closure, uh, closure conversion, right? That will be a free variable in function that will end up here. And because it ends up in the closure, we, the map doesn't need to know about it. The, the capability tunnels through. The capability goes 
the F ha holds on to the capability, the map just says, well, I, I, I return whatever I have, but we still know that the whole thing will uh, essentially throw that exception, because we have to generate the capability here. Okay, and that's why it works. So essentially it's this closure property of capabilities. That things can close over things, which means we don't have to talk about them polymorphically in types. That all happens essentially under the cover. That's the brilliance of it. That's, that's, that's essentially the secret sauce why these capabilities work for effect polymorphism. But of course, nothing comes for free. There's no free lunch, so there's a price to pay. So what's the price? Uh, the price is that... Um, Let's look at this slightly modified program. So instead of uh, having just a map or a list, I do create an iterator from the list that lazily steps through the list, and I map that iterator. And I put that in a try-catch as before, and then I do next on the iterator outside of the try. So the result of that will be an unhandled exception, and a too large exception which is unhandled because uh, well, what this thing will do is it returns another iterator, and the iterator gets called, gets essentially the next function gets involved outside of the try. So uh, when the next function gets involved, involved the function f will be called. Uh, but at that point, uh, the try is out of scope, uh, so we can't handle it anymore. So we could either, of course, change our semantics of the try to be sort of capability safe, to essentially stay on, uh, but that would be very, uh, very complicated, and I don't really know what that would mean. Or we have to prevent this case somehow. And to prevent this case, we need to track in the type which capabilities can be captured by its instances. That's the idea. Okay, so um, let's do a simpler example to see it more clearly. Um, uh, here we have a simple try with resources pattern. It's, uh, it's a function using log file. It takes an operation uh, that uh, takes a file output string, that's the log file, and returns some type t, we don't care which, and using log file is just a wrapper around it that will create a log file, pass it to the operation, close the log file, and return the result of the operation. So it's a typical try with resources pattern, but it exhibits the same problem as before that op might return a closure that accesses log file after it is closed, later on when, when we do that. So it has the same uh, safety problem as a try-catch. And uh, what we do here in the type system is we uh, declare that find output string as a capability. Um, and that's done, oops, sorry. And that's done with this uh, simple caret at the, at the end. Caret means, well, it can refer to anything. It can refer to whatever capability. And if you do that, then uh, this usage here would be ruled out. Uh, so that's an uh, illegal use, of course, because we do, again, xs.iterator map, and then we do a file a write later on. Uh, and the error message we would get is uh, local, ref local reference f leaks into outer scope of type parameter t of method using log file. So essentially that's where the type system catches us and say you can't do that. Okay, uh, on the other hand, we still allow this, we still allow uh, a simple xs.map because at that point all the writes are done, by the end we reach the result. So that's okay. And to achieve this it turns out we need a few annotations on iterator in the standard library and no annotations at all on this. So that's essentially the big gain that we get so far with, with very, very little uh, changes uh, to, to standard types. And uh, Okay, I'm going to show you exactly what they look like later on in the talk. Okay, so before we get there, uh, just some of the technical basics. So what we introduce is these capturing types, uh, which are written uh, a T and then a caret and then a set of capabilities, uh, which are the capabilities captured by the type retained in its environment. And what is a capability? Well, a capability is just a parameter or a local variable. So if we would leave it as that, uh, we would end up with a type system that tracks all free variables of closures, which is also in, by itself interesting, but probably not for a source-level front-end language, because it's too fine-grained. 
too much would break. Every little change when we, when we added another, another free variable would change our type. So we don't want that. So we need to restrict the meaning of what a capability is somewhat more. It's not any parameter or local variable, but uh, it's uh, one of these that has as a type a capturing type with a non-empty capture set. So it's sort of meta-circular here. You say, you are a capability if you capture something which is another capability. Any, every capability you have to get from some, some other more sweeping capability. And indeed, there must be a root capability from which ultimately all others are derived, which is called cap, simply cap in our system. So every capability gets its authority from some other more sweeping capability, which it captures, and in the end you have this root. So I think this is probably the first type systematic account of the object capability model, in the sense that it also tracks retained types and not just parameters that you pass down. Okay, so the syntax of the core, of the smallest core of our language, the simply type lambda calculus variant is uh, this one here. So uh, it's just essentially a, um, a, a simply type lambda calculus within a monadic normal form, uh, actually A and F, I mean, it, technically it's monadic normal form in that we have a left and the left and the left can be nested. Uh, and the other thing that's notable about it is that the function type is variable dependent, so we write it with an x here, because the x is a local parameter that could serve as a capability. So, so the uh, capabilities themselves, they are retained in these uh, capturing types here. So that makes technically our calculus uh, a dependently type lambda calculus, but it's a very mild form of dependency in that the only thing we can track is variables, not full terms. It's actually exactly what Scala does already, so it's a very good fit for Scala because with the, uh, with the dot uh, and the type members we have basically exactly the same kind of, of variable dependencies. So you could say this thing really works well for Scala because there are two things you need. You need these variable dependencies and you need implicit to pass the capabilities and Scala has both of them. So that's why I think it's really a good fit for that. Okay, so um, what we need then is uh, a uh, is uh, a subcapturing relation. So Scala is uh, uh, has subtyping. How does subtyping relate to uh, capabilities? So essentially, what you say is subtyping is influenced by subcapturing. So if you have two types, and let's say the type part is the same, but they capture different capabilities, then uh, there should be a comparison between the two capability sets. In, in, in principle, pure means no capabilities should be a subtype of all the other types. So the more capabilities you capture, the bigger your types become. And if you can capture every, anything at all, then you're at the top of the capability lattice. So subcapturing is defined, simply defined by the subset axioms plus this one, which is very important. This one gives you essentially a refinement, which says, well, we have x here, and it's a capability, it, re it captures something, then that capability by itself also subcaptures the things it derives from. So that means derived capabilities are subtypes, uh, subcaptures of uh, the capabilities that give the derived capabilities their authority. Okay, and that means also that if we instantiate in that rule the C to uh, the empty set, uh, then what we see here is that if X is not a capability, so its capture set is empty, then indeed the capture set X is a subcapture of the empty set by that rule, and that's essentially the rule that, get, that justifies that we can simply drop all free variables that are not capabilities. So that, that's, that's what, what makes it work, that only capability variables are tracked in these sets. If we now look at the simple typing rules, and there's actually not much to it. So uh, the var rule here, the change in the var rule, all changes are out underlined in gray, says, well, if we capture something in a variable, then instead of talking about the captured set, we talk about X itself. By the rule that I've showed you before, X is actually better than the capture set. So we improve the type, and that's important because essentially that means we have sharper types. Uh, what about the abstraction? So for lambda abstraction, uh, the captured set is, now that's a link with the free variables. So it's the free variables of T without, of course, the bound variable X. So we take that and say, well, that's the capture set. 
Uh, that's all free variables, but of course, by subcapturing, we can prune that to those variables that, on, that actually only matter for the capabilities. And finally, the capture set of a closure gets discarded in the application rule because once we apply the closure, uh, we don't need to be, uh, the, the capabilities are not retained any longer. And that's it. There's, there's really not much to it. But, of course, uh, and that's uh, uh, the, the problem usually in these things, and in this particular case also, is uh, polymorphism. And we have uh, grappled a long time with that, and we had, have several different solutions, and uh, the last solution we have, uh, we are quite convinced that that's actually the one that, that, that works, works well. Uh, so, the issue is we could, um, if you look at the syntax, so um, the question is, these capturing types, uh, are they essentially a form of full type, or are they separate? And uh, so it's sort of the difference between system F and Tindley Milner. Do you have a flat type structure, or do you have a nested structure where certain things are only available for certain types? And uh, the, uh, the issue here is, in particular, once we add type variables. So type variables are certainly a shape type, so they are up here. Can uh, essentially type variables also um, uh, be a full type? Uh, so essentially, can they replace capability types? And if we would, if we do that and think it through, then it turns out that means that type variables would contribute to capture sets. So a capture set could now contain not just term variables, parameters, but also type variables, because type variables can, can get instantiated to these things, and that means we have to track them. And we had a design, and uh, uh, we, we pursued that for a while, uh, but it turned out that this really gives nastily large capture sets for simple operations. So, for instance, if I do just construct a pair of things, so pair is generic, uh, then I have to essentially keep, essentially the, the pair constructor has to say, well, I return essentially my two type variables possibly in the result, and all generic operations would have to do that. So what we did instead in the end, which turned out to be much, much nicer, is to uh, say uh, type variables are shape types, and in that case we need an additional box operator so that type variables can be instantiated with box capturing types. So if a type variable is a shape type, it means it, can, it must be pure, no capture set allowed, but you can essentially have a full type with a capture set and then you box it, which means essentially that the capture set is hidden in the box. And that means you, get, you have a, a pure uh, uh, type that you can pass around and uh, uh, then you, have to ha you need a separate unbox operation that opens it again. So it turns out that this choice gave much smaller capture sets and doesn't lose much in expressiveness, and further that all this boxing, unboxing infrastructure can be completely inferred. So this is essentially all uh, in, in, uh, underneath in the system. So we picked that uh, version, and uh, that will be in an upcoming paper in Toplas and Popper 2024 with that, with that system. So I uh, won't go into uh, um, a, a lot more details about this because this talk is about what we do in Scala for capture tracking, but uh, just as a reference, if you want to find out more, then uh, that's in the paper and also sort of uh, just as a, as a link, typically if you assess uh, a system for, for these resources or things like that, then the critical point is always, always, always polymorphism, just so generics, so that's the one. And the typical way to get out of it, but it's also a problematic way, is to say monomorphize and check after, because polymorphism is gone, but then of course you have the problem that essentially errors might manifest in user levels that really have their sources in deep in, 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 in some library. So if you don't want to do that, then you have to invent something else, and that's where typically things get hard, and we're quite happy with the uh, boxing solution that we found. Okay, so what we, what we have then, we have this core type system, we have to extend it to objects and uh, classes and all this, and that's essentially done uh, without, uh, we, we still need a formal theory for that, so that's ongoing work, uh, but we have it in the capture checker, so we have uh, a capture checker in the Scala compiler that's implemented as an additional compiler parse after typing, sort of similar to the borrow checker in Rust, so borrow checker is also a separate phase, uh, so is the capture checker. So what we do is we take the whole program and we decorate all inferred types with capture set variables. Uh, so, 
country we say, well, because we don't know what the capture set part of it, we checked without capture sets before, let's essentially add a capture set variable on each type that we infer. And then we just run the recheck the program with the usual typing rules. But it's much simpler now because we have already done all type inference and implicit search and overloading resolution and all these things are gone. So all we need to do is really the core typing rules, which is about 400 lines of code or something like that. The, the core, the core Scala type checker for essentially the the, uh, the 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 rules after type inference. So we do that. We recheck the program and. Uh, in rechecking, we generate subcapturing constraints on these capture sets that we have added. And we solve those uh, constraints incrementally using propagation. So it's sort of, um, it's a global constraint solver in that sense, similar to, to Hindley Milner, but uh, where Hindley Milner uses unification, uh, we use uh, subtyping as usual, and that leads us to these subcapturing constraints on the capture sets. Uh, the most tricky aspect was to handle type maps. So in this type checker, there are various maps on types. So, for instance, there's this famous as seen from map, which, have, uh, which uh, regulates how the type of a member of a class changes when you see it from a certain qualifier prefix. Uh, there are avoidance maps, which say that you, 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 can, you cannot use certain types uh, outside the scope where they're defined, so you have to widen to something else. And then finally, there are substitutions of parameters to arguments. So all these type maps have to be handled in the capture checker as well. And uh, that means the way we do that is we classify those type maps into bijective and idempotent and essentially have a specialized treatment for each kind of maps. And bijective is uh, sound and complete, and idempotent is only, uh, only sound. That means we might lose some precision, but in practice, it seems to work out. And then for the box and unbox operations, they can be inferred based on the actual and expected types, similar to the way the type checker inserts implicit conversions. So what we've done so far uh, is uh, that uh, uh, we, we actually uh, capture check the dot compiler itself. Uh, so we added that for essentially a very specific kind of effect. Uh, the compiler has uh, contexts everywhere. It's an almost pure functional compiler, so anything, everything needs to know, it gets passed in a con context, and contexts get sort of updated functionally, so they are sort of a tree of things. And uh, uh, a lot of them generated millions per second, and uh, they're fairly large, a couple hundred bytes. Uh, and, and so the idea was to use arena allocation for these contexts and see what happens. Uh, Turned out, notationally, the capture checking overhead was okay, was quite reasonable because the compiler is already fairly functional, uh, so not, not so many side effects in there, and side effects are quite localized. Uh, but uh, the gains were actually less than expected uh, because essentially that had to do with the way we essentially treated the arena allocation. So essentially we pushed the copying around a little bit, but in the end it didn't help so much. It had, we gained a couple percentage points which actually is very hard to get in the Scala compiler, but still we, we, we haven't actually merged that up, uh, until this stage because it, it wasn't clear that the games were big enough. Um, then the other thing that we are currently doing is port the standard library. That's of course necessary for anyone to use this in, in real production. You need to be able to use the standard library, and that means you need to know that an iterator captures things, but a list doesn't, so that means that these things have to be captured annotated. So that's, uh, that's ongoing, and that caused us to rethink our encapsulation policy. So as I said previously, capture tracking doesn't really come with a fixed policy. You can add, add, add them. The previous policy had to do with boxing, and the new one had to do with the sealed. Uh, if you have a look at a very attentive reader, then there was a sealed on a type variable. So essentially we say certain type variables are sealed, and that means they don't let you escape things, whereas other type variables are okay. Okay, and then we, we are also working on a new stack for direct style continuation based concurrency and I.O., and that's also ongoing work. So in practice, the annotation overhead actually has turned out to be very reasonable. So uh, to show you that is here's the, uh, just an excerpt of a uh, list of the standard library. Uh, it's list itself is, is more complicated, of course, much bigger, more than a thousand lines of implementations. But that's sort of the thing that, that, that shows the illustrated, that, that shows what changes. 
So what actually does change is uh, actually quite tiny. That I think those are the two changes here. Uh, and we wouldn't even need them uh, because essentially what that thing says is uh, a flat map takes an A and it gives you a, an iterable once of B. And we say, and by the way, this iterable once also can, ha can hang on to any capability that it chooses to. If we had dropped the arrow, then only pure iterable ones would, would have worked. But here we said, no, no, it's okay. The, the, the result of a, of a fl flat map can, when you iterate it, have effects on its own. So that gives us a more general type for a flat map. And the same thing for uh, plus plus, uh, where we say the, the thing that we add uh, to a collection, uh, to a list, can be, for instance, an iterator. Uh, so iterators are iterable ones, and any sort of collection <coughs> is iterable ones and the iterator could have a side effect. Uh, so it's probably not good style to have an iterator with a side effect and append it to a list uh, uh, when the side effect will be executed when you append it, but it's, it's permissible, so, so we can allow that. So by contrast, let's look at the API of iterators. So the first thing is again as it was, and here then there are the following changes now that we say, okay, so for a map of an iterator, we say, well, it, we return a new iterator, but it will hang on to the existing iterator and also to the function f, which can be a side effecting function, double arrow. Here. So that's what we need here. And the same thing for flat map, uh, this and f, and the same thing for uh, plus plus, where we say it hangs on to both the current iterator and the iterable ones that we append to the iterator. Both of it, it, it will hang on to both of, both of these things. I think the point I want to make is that to say these are actually useful annotations. These are quite intuitive to say, well, it's actually good to know uh, what an iterator will hang on to because essentially these are possible uh, delayed effects. So uh, and I, I value in my type system that I know about these things. This is not a nuisance where I say, well, I have to invent lots of polymorphism and, and type parameters for these things which are sort of all boilerplate cranky things. Now these are very specific information that is also useful. Okay, last um, uh, chapter, uh, we still have a little bit, or, yeah, okay, is about control, uh, dark style control, and uh, that's something that has been very, uh, has had a sort of revival, I mean, the limited continuations are of course very old, uh, uh, but uh, it's sort of that industry is finally waking up to them to, in the form of essentially green threads or fibers, or sometimes they go for the real thing, uh, which is which is continuations. So examples are goroutines, uh, of course, existed for a number of years now, and Loom has now finally ch shipped in the latest Java. Loom is essentially virtual threads of fibers, uh, coroutines, uh, stackful coroutines in Java, uh, Kotlin uh, coroutines, which are stackless coroutines. Uh, you know, Camel or Haskell, we have limited continuations, and then there's also uh, increasing interest in research languages like Effect or Coca. Uh, and I believe that this is about to influence libraries and frameworks, and it's about to uh, essentially shift the focus more or less away from the previous monadic effect frameworks to that. So I think that that really is, is a very promising uh, development, very promising future that, that might happen in the industry. So uh, what, we, what we're doing in Scala is we want to build a low-level direct style stack uh, that where um, what we've done is, uh, the first thing is just essentially uh, aborts, boundary break, that, that's it already in the standard library. Uh, we, then we add error handling on top of that, uh, with a sort of Rust-like result and question mark. Uh, then we add suspensions, uh, and uh, that uh, has shipped recently in Scala Native, uh, suspensions as delimited continuations. Uh, then uh, we are building a concurrency library on top of that, which is called Gears. That's work that's in, in progress, and Gears will work on both uh, JVM and Scala Native. So when Scala Native uses suspensions in, on the JVM, we're going to use Loom. And uh, then on top of Gears, we have plans for doing streaming, HTTP client, server, and essentially an application stack, a direct style application stack on top of that. So to get started, uh, uh, we do boundary break, and that's actually the, the, the reason that was invented is actually due to Jonathan, I think. 
uh, that sort of started it all. Um, so, so Jonathan, uh, he sent me a message at some point and said, well, he's teaching Scala, and uh, in Scala 3, we don't have uh, non-local returns anymore. So non-local returns are out. You, can, you can't return from a closure. You can only return from the body itself. And he said, well, what, what should I recommend to students using? Well, you can use a fail recursive thing or things like that. But students, they, they just want to return. And, and, and I said, well, that's, that's reasonable, uh, so let's, uh, but we don't want to go back to non-local returns because non-local returns were too confusing. People, people didn't know uh, it looked like a normal return and they didn't realize that it's actually something heavier, like an exception was thrown and things like that. So, so we, we said, well, let's invent a new uh, construct, which is called boundary and break. So this is what it looks like. So I think it was even the example you gave me, first index, uh, uh, that, that he said, well, find the first element in a list of, uh, of elements. So what you want to do is uh, you go to the list, you zip it with the index, and you say, well, if the element is the first part here, then essentially return the index. And the way we can do this, and if you don't find the list, return minus one. So uh, you can do that now by essentially wrapping the whole thing in a boundary. This thing is just essentially a, a function call, so boundary is uh, the argument here is, a, is an argument for the function boundary, and uh, in here uh, we have a break in, in the boundary. So boundary is, establishes a boundary and break returns a value from it. Super simple. So here's the stack view, and we say well, we have a stack, and at some point we declare a boundary, and then we say break x, and that would essentially return to the boundary and uh, with x as the result. So here's how it would be implemented. Uh, so uh, we uh, essentially the way we do it, we define an object boundary which has an apply method. So that's why we can apply it, we can pass things to it. That's the Scala idiom. We always have like sequence, list, they're all objects with apply methods. Okay, so the, the, what, what do we pass in the apply method? Well, we pass a context function that takes a label and returns a T. And the label of T is essentially something that essentially accepts a break uh, for the thing. So we have this class label, uh, which is contravariant in T because it accepts values. And then what the break does is it says, okay, so we break with a value. We need a label to which we can return. The type of the break is nothing, which means there's nothing, the, 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 the computation will stop at this point. And we just essentially we throw a break exception with the label. And, and value, and that break exception will be handled uh, by the boundary call. So what you see here is to break, you need a label that represents the boundary. So in that sense, a label is a capability that enables you to break, and that's a very common pattern. And it turns out that when I showed you the exception, there's a bit more to it than that. Implementation of break actually produces uh, very efficient code because if the break appears in the same stack frame as its boundary, then we translate that to just a jump. So it's optimally efficient. And otherwise, we use an exception, but a fast exception that doesn't capture the stack traces. So that exception is also reasonably efficient. Uh, I think at some point I heard from John Rose from the JVM team about three, for three virtual uh, function calls. That's about the price you pay for, for one of these. So it's, it's quite reasonable. And uh, we don't need a stack trace. Why? Because we know that the exception will be handled. We have a handler. We don't throw an exception into the void and just keep fingers crossed that it's handled and then it might crash. And when it crashes, we need to know what happened. Well, uh, I have to qualify that, of course. To be 100% sure, this needs capture checking. That's where capture checking comes in. That this, uh, well, to make sure that we don't essentially escape something that hangs on to the label when the label is no longer on the stack. That needs capture checking. Okay, so once we have that, we can go, go on and do error handling. Uh, so here's a, a function uh, that uh, takes a matrix, uh, implemented here as a list of list of t's, and it gives you the uh, first column of, the, of, of that matrix. But of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, first column might not exist for some of the rows. So for the first column of the, uh, to exist, every row must be now empty. So we'd have to check that. So here's a way to express that. We say, well, we want to return, well, we want to return none if it doesn't work. One of the rows is, is empty. So to do that, we, have, we wrap it in an optional, and we say XSS map head option. Head option gives you uh, the head uh, of, of the thing wrapped in a sum if it exists, and 
none if, it's, if it doesn't. And then we, took, we put a dot question mark. So dot question mark essentially strips away the option. If the option is a sum, then it, that's, that's the value that we return. If it's a none, then it will break to the enclosing optional. OK, so how is that implemented? Well, actually, it's also pretty, pretty simple. So the apply method of optional, so uh, that takes a body uh, and that uh, gives a label. In this case, the label, all I can do with the label is return none. So that would be the type of the label. And it's just boundary of sum of body. So the body says wrap the body in a sum and put it in a boundary. That's all I need to do. So what's the question mark then? So the question mark is a method on option, the extension method syntax. So we say we take an option of t and we say on an option of t we can do dot question mark. It needs a label of number type and it says, well, let's see what the option is. If the option is defined, if it's a sum of x, we return x. If it's not defined, then we break with the, with the number value. That's all we need to do. So, and of course we can analogous, do analogous implementations for other result types. There's no magic to it. What, uh, what, so for instance, we could do what, uh, either, and my favorite actually is a Rust-like result, which we have in our own com current library that we use in the compiler, actually. Uh, but we, we, we will publish that soon. So the ideal error handling would be based on result, uh, on result plus question mark, similar to Rust, but it works for deep in stacks, which for Scala is very important because a lot of control structures use closures, so you want to return from these closures uh, without, uh, in the same way, you return from, 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 from simple methods. So it's sort of like a super-powered Rust uh, uh, error type. Okay, so that brings me to stage three, which are the suspensions. So. Uh, Suspensions is simply what if you could store the stack segment and resume it at a later time. So what we want to do is uh, we want to essentially take the stack segment between a boundary and uh, the, the, the current point and we want to essentially move it to the side, suspend it and restore it at a, at a later time. And that of course is the idea of delimited continuations. So our delimited continuation library, we call them suspensions because it's less scary than delimited continuations. And we call them resume and suspend and not shift and reset, which is utterly, utterly frightening for many people. So um, a suspension is just uh, a thing that you can resume. And uh, you, there's a suspend operation which takes a body which takes a suspension, can do something with the suspension, and returns return a t, uh, an R, and uh, it, that one needs essentially the label, the boundary. So suspensions are quite powerful because they can express at the same time algebraic effects and monads. So let me explain that a little bit in the end. So here I have a very simple algebraic effect, so it's, it's essentially a Python style generator. Uh, so uh, the example here I have here is I have generate, and then uh, I have produce. In Python, produce will be yield. And I can essentially go through some control flow, and I can essentially put, push these things to the generator. Generator is basically the same thing as an iterator with a slightly different API. So each time I, I produce something, I have one more value in the iterator to iterate through. So in a generator, it's just essentially a, and it's where an iterator has next and has next, this one is next option. It gives you next option, uh, an option of t. Okay, or here's another thing which is now stackful and therefore a bit more complicated uh, to, to handle. So we have a tree, uh, an enum, which is a leaf or an inner, and uh, we want to find out all, find all the leaves of the tree in a generator. So uh, we say generate, then we recur uh, in the tree. Say so if the tree is a leaf, then we produce the, the next leaf value. If it's an inner, then we recur for each of the inner nodes. That's essentially all we need to do here. So if you look at that from the algebraic effect views, then that thing is an effect scope. This generates, and it also defines a handler. And, if, and that produces the effect. We produce an, an effect, the next value that, that we generate from the tree. OK, so how would generate then uh, be implemented? So in generate, so we need to uh, write a generator. A uh, generator needs a next option. And we say, well, uh, let's delegate that to another thing called step. So what is step? Step, uh, when called, needs to return an optional value. So 
here's our old friend boundary again. So we say, okay, so now we need to um, produce, um, okay, so no, I, I, I skipped over that. This generator essentially needs a capability, which is this produce of the, the capability to produce something. So we need to generate that, and it's a capability, so it's, it's passed as an implicit, so the way to do that in Scala 3 is, is a given. So we say, okay, there's a given produce of P, where the produce method is defined like this. So what does the produce method do? It suspends, uh, it takes the suspension, the continuation of the operation where we are. That's the K, that uh, comes out of the suspend. And what it then says, it does is it, it says, well, the next time you call step, we resume the continuation and go on, right? So that's essentially, we, we set the variable step, so here we have a variable to essentially the resumption of that continuation. And at the same time, we, re we return now the, the, the current value x from the iterator. Okay, so that's our handler. And then we essentially pass, just pass the handler to body and return now. So if I take a step back, so what we've done is, Effects are simply methods of effect traits. The, so like the, the, the producer was that. And handlers are implementations of effect traits, which are defined as implicit values, given typically, and passed as implicit parameters. So the handler can abort as part of the computation. So first, when you call the handler, it's actually called on the call stack of the client. So it's, it's just a function that you call, a, a virtual function that you, that you pass down. And, uh, uh, so, uh, so then that function can choose to abort, that's a break, or it can also choose to essentially just return, do nothing, return that will be a resume, or finally it can choose to suspend the computation as a, and, 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 and resume it later. So that's an interesting approach, uh, and it's slightly different from the more traditional view of uh, algebraic effects, which often gets characterized to say algebraic effects are resumable exceptions. Uh, so, because in resumable exceptions, essentially, somebody throws an exception or raises an effect. Somebody else hopefully handles it. Uh, the type system by itself doesn't give you that. But we don't actually know statically which handler. We can declare exceptions, of course, and we know that some handler will capture them, but you can always essentially smuggle a handler into the stack. So you think, you think down there, you throw an exception, and I say, up here I have a handler, and there's some virtual calls in between that I don't know what to, what's in there. One, one of these virtual calls might contain another handler for a for, for your effect, and then it will be that handler that captures it. Very powerful, but also potentially quite, quite, quite scary and unsafe. So I think this is sort of akin to dynamic scoping, really, whereas uh, continuations are really static scoping. Uh, dynamic scoping in the sense that your dynamic call stack depends, can, can decide what handler actually gets caught. Okay, so to implement these suspensions, uh, there, there are several possibilities. So uh, we've done them uh, for um, uh, native directly in the runtime. Uh, there's some effort to make them work on top of Loom. Uh, Jonathan can, can tell you more about that. Uh, it's not always easy going. It seems to they have like 95% of the right abstractions, but not 100%, something like that. Um, one could also do bytecode or sorcery writing, and we're looking into that. Uh, okay, so the other thing is monads. So we can do uh, uh, the, these uh, suspensions and continuations can do monads, and that brings us back to a famous pair of papers uh, 20 years ago, in 1993. Uh, uh, the, uh, Phil Bottler wrote essentially the seminal paper on monads for imperative programming in, in Haskell, and he showed that uh, continuations can be expressed as a monad, and Somewhat provocatively, his paper ends with the statement, so in that sense, Haskell is the essence of ML. Uh, then a year later, Filinski came back and showed that every monad can be expressed in direct style using just delimited continuations. That was essentially when, uh, around the, type, uh, the, the time when they were maybe not invented, but when people first took notice of delimited continuations. And he, of course, had to end the paper with ML as the uh, essence of Haskell. So we have, we have actually implemented Filinski's monadic reflection suspensions, and that was uh, last year in the talk at HOPE. So to conclude, uh, the capture-checked capabilities have the potential to solve some long-standing problems. 
I've talked about effect polymorphism, getting flexibility without the overhead. Uh, Linked to that is really this what color is your function problem of uh, asynchronous computation because that's just an effect polymorphism. We want to have the same computation work for sync and async. Uh, I haven't talked about uh, resources for uh, allocation, but when we have a prototype to do regions uh, in the system for arena allocations and on top of uh, together with the garbage collector and uh, the other exciting area is fearless concurrency, excluding data races and other hazards. And Yichen will have a talk about essentially our thoughts uh, uh, of this later in the workshop. Uh, so I think in summary, I think uh, capture checking is particularly good in situations where only a few capabilities need to be tracked. There's this sort of things to say, well, if things are predominantly pure, there's nothing to do. Uh, you, pay, you pay for what you use. You pay for just a few capabilities. So it's, 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 it's really good in mostly functional with few resources to manage, which is essentially precisely the spot Scala is in. And that's why I think it's actually a very good fit for, for what, what, what Scala, Scala is and a very good way to extend it further. So to find out more for capture calculus, the, the first publication was the Scala Workshop 2021. There's an upcoming Toplas Popple paper. Uh, for the capture checking prototype and user guide, you can just Google Scala 3 capture checking. There's some user guide material there if you want to, uh, if you are feel adventurous and want to use it, but we still have to get the standard library into, into a capture check thing. So for, for the moment, it's basically just exploration, but not production use. But hopefully, over the next months, we'll be able to, to ship the standard library in capture check form. And if you want to look at the code, then it's lamp in pfl uh, the, the branch where we, where we work. No, it's, it's actually in main, but the, the pull requests, uh, it's all labeled the CC experiment. So if you want to find out what happens there, then uh, look for that label in the repo. And that's it. That's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, sorry to go a bit, it's gone a bit over time. So, do we have someone who wants to ask a question? Hi, um, I was kind of curious about how you do um, the effect handling, and for example, um, can you support non-determinism and with multiple resumptions? Um, that's known to be interacting very badly with mutable state, and um, you seem to use uh, mutable state pervasively. So, um, you should ask Jonathan that, he's, he's the expert on these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, our, our answer is single shot only, so no, 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 uh, no non-determinism in that sense. Uh, because, precisely, we, we haven't figured out how, how, to, how to do mutable state, and the answer might be, it's too complicated, we will, we will essentially just limit ourselves to where, where it's not a problem. Yeah, people tend to lump all the state onto a big top-level handler, which is kind of... Um, not very good design, so this is yeah. kind of I'm very curious how, how one would solve this in general. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, but if I look at what actually, um, where we actually need this thing, then I would say 95% is async right now, <laughs> and uh, if you have a good solution for async, uh, that's, that's what people clamor for, essentially. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Another one, maybe? Okay, if not, then I don't want to keep everyone waiting because we are already past um, the end. So uh, thank you again, Martin, for the. Thank you.